1874, when Edwin Booth came to the theater in Chicago where I was leading man, I pray Cassius to his Brutus one night and Brutus to his Cassius the next, uh, Othello to his Iago and so on. But the first night I played Othello, Edwin Booth said to our manager, that young man is playing Othello better than I ever did. That from Booth, the greatest actor of his day, or any other. And it was true. This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. By now, you've all heard a lot about the remarkable revival of Long Day's Journey in Tonight. We're so happy to have one of its stars with us and here to introduce him, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Brian Dennehy gives a terrific performance as James Tyrone in Long Day's Journey in Tonight. Uh, you saw him a few seasons back uh, as Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman, for which he won a Tony Award. Terrific actor and a uh, a great wit and um, great uh, hanger out at Angus McIndoe's, which is where we met. <laughs> Among other bars, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Brian Dennehy, welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. All right. Um, this is, uh, many people's estimation, the, the great American play, mm. Long Day's Journey and Tonight. However, you and I spoke the other day about this, and you actually think it was the play that you did before, Death of a Salesman, is the great American play. Well, no, play. I think that they're... Uh, they're both extremely important. I mean, you, you know, you're talking about a real close horse race there between which is the more important play in terms of the American dramatic canon. Um, it's it's a pretty tight race. I mean, the thing that's interesting about Salesman is that it's more accessible. Uh, the audience is it's 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 more dramatic. It's more. Uh, has a, a greater impact. Whereas with all of O'Neill's work, the impact is, is, is more like a steady dripping. Mm -hmm. It just slowly builds and builds and builds. I mean, it was very important to O'Neill uh, the repetition and the length of the play. He wanted to kind of wear the audience down. And he was right about that. He was right about the, the impact of a, just a saturation of ideas and the repetition of ideas. I've done a lot of O'Neill and um, uh, the longers, the, the moments of repetition, the moments of what seem to be uh, boring stretches and repetitions are very, very important. So you disagree when people say uh, O'Neill should have had an editor? No. I, I don't agree with that at all. O'Neill knew exactly what he was doing. He was one of the great theatrical craftsmen. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, when we, we live in a time when the typical Broadway play runs about... 90 minutes. No other minutes. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and God forbid you should have more than two, two uh, intermissions. Right. right. Uh, and, and, you know, that's fine. I mean, you know, we, we, we all know the good theater can be made in, in that short period of time. But the fact is that he understood something about the experience of theater, which was uh, something that the Greeks understood and that the great traditional craftsmen of the past, which is that it's a religious experience. Hmm. And like most religious experiences, it takes a lot of time <laughs> for it to wear in. Well, he, uh, what's extraordinary about Long Day's Journey tonight is that I, I found the four and a half hours to be not difficult at all yeah. because of this production, but also um, the world O'Neill creates, and he gradually brings you, in, you in. To, and it, gradually it comes is a point, an yes. important word. And it comes a point where you feel that you are in that room with those characters, mm. and that's where the pain comes from, because you're that close to their pain and emotional Yeah, story. I mean, obviously, it's not the kind of thing that's being done now, and that's fine, but the fact is O'Neill was the great craftsman of that. I mean, people forget O'Neill had won a Nobel Prize and three Pulitzers by 35 or 36, at which time he announced that everything that he had done up to that time was crap. Mm -hmm. And he was now going to start to work on his life work, his masterworks. And of course, he was not in favor in the mid 30s, um, although he had been a huge, powerful, he was the original uh, serious American playwright. There was no one before yeah. Eugene O'Neill. And everybody kind of shrugged it off, and then he proceeded to write Long Day's Journey, Moon for the Misbegotten, Iceman Cometh, uh, Touch Huey. of the Poet, yeah. Huey, 
and of course all the stuff that he wrote for the cycle, yeah. which most most of which he destroyed, but Morning Becomes Electra is was one of them. So he was right about that. He yeah. did and write that's his great work. Yeah. yeah. What, what, wasn't he playing Beat the Clock on Death when he wrote Long Day's Journey? Wasn't no, not really, it? because no. what happened uh, on it would have been better probably if he had. He wrote. The, all those plays over an extended period of time from 1939 to about 1941. He wrote very quickly, mm -hmm. uh, O'Neill, and he wrote a lot. He yeah. had to go back and cut. Unfortunately uh, for him, he developed this, uh, this disease, which there's a great deal of argument about what it was. It was similar to Parkinson's, but they say now that it wasn't Parkinson's. But he could not physically write his, uh, his hand would tremble so badly, and the more he concentrated, the more he trembled. So the, the tragedy uh, from, from, uh, of Gene O'Neill is from the 1940 to uh, the mid-50s, some 15 years, he was not able to write at all. Oh. And this, uh, this is a man that uh, lived in by his work, like most great artists. Yeah. Did he stipulate that this couldn't be produced till after his death? No, it wasn't supposed to be produced at all. Oh, but once he died, read. a lot of the widow. It could be read. And he, but he said, "I don't want a production." Twenty-five years. He he sent a copy to Bennett Cerf, mm -hmm. who was a publisher, mm -hmm. <laughs> Random House. And Bennett Cerf, actually, interestingly enough, was the guy who was enraged by the fact that Carlotta was going to have it published and, and ultimately done. It was it was done first in Stockholm. And of course, Jose Quintero prevailed upon her to do the original production, she agreed. Now, you know, you can have mixed feelings about that because the fact is, of course, this great play was done originally with Frederick March and Jason Robards and Florence Eldridge, uh, and thank God it was done. But at the same time, you have to be sympathetic to O'Neill's wishes. Now, there are people who say, well, he really, knowing what Carlotta was and who she was, that she would, wouldn't hesitate for And what was minutes. she? She was a pretty tough broad. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the fascinating thing about O'Neill, his grandfather, uh, uh, James O'Neill's father, abandoned his family and went back to Ireland and probably committed suicide in Ireland, uh, leaving his wife and six children in extreme poverty in the United States during about the time of the Civil War. Which is one of the speeches that your character gives right. in the play. True story. James O'Neill, or James Tyrone, was a guy who stuck with this crazy-ass family and did what he thought he should do. And then Eugene O'Neill proceeded to terribly abuse or his children, not abuse his children, but just ignore them. So that of the three kids that he had, two of them were suicides. And Una probably drank herself to death. Hmm. So, you know, that gene, that seed of... Uh, destructive, destructive towards so, other so people. But that's father. what this. However, I would point out, Eugene O'Neill writes a speech for his mother in the middle of the play, where his mother, Ella, was his real mother, Mary Tyrone in the play, says, "I never should have borne him. He'll never be happy, nor healthy." He, ne he never should have been born. This is about himself. He wrote this speech about himself, puts those words in his mother's mouth. This was when he was about 47 or 48 years old. This was a man who knew what a disaster his life had been and what it was continuing to be. And to write those words about his own life. He says Edmund, his, the O'Neill character, Eugene mm. O'Neill character in the play says, it was a great mistake my having been born a man. I, I should have been, been born, born a seagull or a fish. fish. Yeah. yeah. This family, though, which tortures each other and attacks each other and lies to each other and then uses the truth to hurt each other. And is also addicted. Yeah. I mean, All of them are addicted. It does something. But they do love each other, too. Do they yes, not? there is this love. Of course, there is this tremendous love, but there is this great aching need for love. I mean... He, Mary is a mean, cruel son of a bitch. I mean, she, she withholds 
uh, her love from the children. Um, uh, probably the juxtaposition of this, these phrases is not particularly happy, but I, I maintain that this is the first feminist play ever written in America. Nobody's ever called Eugene O'Neill a feminist. <laughs> no. <laughs> in fact, up until the time he wrote Mary Tyrone, his mother, uh, he did not really pay much attention to women's parts except for All God's Children and a couple of other things. But this play, uh, he was very affected by Ibsen and Strindberg, of course. And what is he saying in this play? He's saying that this woman, who was a 19th century woman, was robbed and of her, her life. And her plight is so terrible. She was taken, her life was taken away from her. She, not that she was enormously intelligent or had this great talent, which she always maintains that she does, but the fact is, the only happy day she's ever known when, when she was a kid. And she wasn't entitled to a life in terms That's of right, that society. Because in those yeah. days, you lived your husband's life. Yeah. This is a very interesting. I mean, if I were a 20-year-old kid at Harvard or wherever, I would, uh, my, my PhD thesis would be on Eugene O'Neill, feminist playwright. Because how, I think he was. How much of her uh, personality, though, you say she's mean. How much of that is well, because... Well, she's mean in the context of what we expect a, maternal, a mom to be. But right, how much yeah. of that is because she, she's a drug addict? I mean, I mentioned that before, but that's to me such a study of addiction of several different kinds, but and Edmund particularly says, hers. Edmund says in the play, she does it deliberately. Yeah. Well, but that she does it to separate herself from us. She does it because it gives her excuse. Why do people drink? This is something Michael and I are familiar with. <laughs> but, <laughs> but right. why do they drink? Because they do. They, it's a choice. Because if you drink and you get drunk, you then have you have an excuse. Well, it's a choice, but she's she's beyond choice when she speaks of her soul having been taken from her. That she is she, since in that day that there's no addiction services and they don't understand her, her family. That she is so hooked on that morphine and she doesn't know how to get off. But and there's it's a choice killing. involved, and I'll tell you why there's a choice involved. Because the, the minute the old man gets sick and he's dying, uh -huh. she cleans up. She inherits the money. She cleans up. She inherits the money, and what does she do after? complaining bitterly for years about being dragged on the road, she travels. Mm. Mm -hmm. This is the real, this is the real moment. The real oh, the real, I see, yeah. When, she, when, dies, yeah. she dies in Los Angeles, which is a perfect place to die. Yeah, because she did, it, this is not clear, <laughs> this is not in the play, of course, mm -hmm. but in yeah. real life, she got off morphine. She got off morphine, but right about the time the father was, and she and Jamie, who was probably her real love, and certainly she was his real love. The older brother. The older brother, traveled. And uh, she died in Los Angeles. And when she died, it, it literally killed Jamie. Mm. Uh, he, he was put on a train to go back east along with her body, although she was obviously in the baggage car. He got into a, a, a compartment with a hooker and a case of booze. <laughs> yep. And stay drunk, and that's the and that's the stuff of Moon for the Mystery. This is God. this is in Moon for the Mystery. Well, God. well, I mean, and I think that's what they nowadays excuse the expression called codependent. That there's there's there are two. These were these two addicts living off of each I other. I suppose, yeah. I mean, uh, the uh, <laughs> we. Uh, I don't want to throw we, jargon. Bob and I have been, we're trying Bob to Falls, put, your director. Bob Falls and I have been trying to put put this project together. Uh, we did it in Chicago, but we're trying to put it together in New York for a couple of years. And the script was sent to a relatively well-known uh, New York actor who happens to be Jewish. And he called up David Richenthal after reading it and said, what is all this with this drinking? <laughs> 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 and David said, you're probably not the, the right, right guy. For this you need a good <laughs> Irish actor to be in this play. Uh, you have a very good uh, Mary Tyrone in your production, Vanessa Redgrave. Mm. First time you guys have ever worked together? Yes, first time. I've worked with her sister, Lynn, yeah. but I've never worked with... Uh... Uh, we were talking at our usual hangout there, uh, the third floor of Angus McIndoe's the other night, and you said something to me. You said you were learning a lot from Vanessa Redgrave. What do the you, Brian Denny, have to learn from another actor? Uh, well, I've not only learned from her, I've learned very, a lot from Philip Seymour Hoffman. Um, we have Robert Sean Leonard and Philip Seymour Hoffman, two actors, six names. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> Uh, the thing that's amazing about Vanessa is that she she comes on stage and every nerve ending is 
just vibrating. I mean, she's partic she's ready for anything that happens, and you better be ready for anything that happens. She's like a force of nature. There's no, she has, she has no editing process. Mm. She just comes on and she explodes, which is one of the reasons why she's a star, probably the, the reason why she's a star, because the audience can't take their eyes off her. What is she going to do next? What is she going to say next? How is she going to deal with this? I've never worked with anyone like her, and it's been amazing for me. It's been a liberating. You know, I'm used to 30 years, 40 years in this business. You prepare a part, and then you go on stage, and you try to deliver that prepared performance, but, you know, you try to create within the context of, a, of that preparation, and you try to see what you can find. She doesn't have any of that. She just really? comes on stage and fires the gun. I mean, and you've got to be ready. And you don't know what's going to happen? No, you don't really know what's going to happen. I mean, obviously, she... You know, she's a professional. She, I mean, yeah, she's, she's a professional, yeah. and it's, it's, it's shaped within a certain you know, set of parameters. But it's very, very powerful and very uh, fresh and very new every night. And she changes things. She mm. just goes and changes. I mean, it's, I got to tell you, you know, people say, well, you know, God, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not O'Neill or it's not Mary Tyrone, but the fact of the matter is that what she does is what people come away from that performance saying, I understand O'Neill now in a way that I never did before. Mm. She I performs the actual function of an actor better than anybody I've ever seen, which is to take a playwright, to take a play and explode it and to, uh, and to have the audience go out of the theater at the end of the night saying, okay, now I know what the hell that play is all about. I mean, she's astounding, mm -hmm. absolutely astounding. She's like a hurricane. She's like a tornado. She's, I've never worked with anybody like her in my life. She's absolutely marvelous. Does and that I, hurt? I wouldn't change anything. Does that hurricane and tornado start when she arrives in the theater, or does it come on when she goes on? Is she like that? No, no, she's the sweetest, nicest person. But you guys don't world. talk politics, right? Since you no, we don't from, talk politics. You come from different <laughs> ends of the political spectrum. But that's okay. I, I, we, were, we, were, we, were, uh, we were up in uh, New London. I'm an ex-Marine, and I have an ex-Marine's uh, political depth. <laughs> and I don't apologize for it. <laughs> But we were up in New London, and this was right after three or four days into the war, and uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, and, and she, somebody said something, and we never talk about politics, we, you know, because there's enough politics in this goddamn play to worry <laughs> about. So Philip Seymour Hoffman said something, like, I hate this goddamn war, and, and she said, oh, I hate this lousy war too, and of course I couldn't have, I couldn't stopped myself and I said, yeah, I know, it's a shitty, terrible war, but it's the only one we got. <laughs> <laughs> Did they get the joke? I don't know. They always look at me horrified every time I say <laughs> Every time you come in with a clutch, you a copy of the New York Post. Um, you, <clears throat> another thing once I remember we talked about, you said there was a period in this re rehearsal that you were lost in this. Well, what happened, it was character. interesting. I, I learned so much. I mean, one of the wonderful things about this business, especially doing very, very difficult plays, to be learning, constantly learning at my age, anything is great. And I came in having done the part a year ago in Chicago, saying, well, I'm way ahead of the game. Right. I mean, all these schmucks, I, you know, I know my lines and blah, blah, blah. And that was a huge dis disadvantage, as it turns out. Not an advantage, but a disadvantage, because I had this concept mm. that I had developed in Chicago. This is the way the part should be played. Mm -hmm. And I realized two weeks into it, especially playing with Vanessa and Philip and Bobby, that that was bullshit. I couldn't, I couldn't hide behind whatever the hell it was I had created in Chicago. I had to ship that over the side. So I actually started two weeks behind everybody else. Oh, that's else. interesting. So in other words, your James Tyrone was sort of uh, James O'Neill's Monte Cristo. You had the set, ah. the set showpiece <laughs> well, that you God would bring in with you. You know, I've done, I've made 
all those mistakes in my life anyway as an actor. I mean, I've done every shitty ass TV show and, <laughs> and uh, you know, policewoman and whatever, you know, because in those days, of course, I was trying to put my kids through college. So right. That's my excuse. And I'm Does, let to me it. ask you, though, does it, as, as James yeah. Tyrone says in that great, great speech in the play, he says, I, you know, I could have been a great Shakespearean actor, I could have been an artist. And I chucked it all away to make money doing the Count of Monte mm. Cristo. Does doing that kind of work, policewoman, whatever it is, does it take its toll on you as an artist? Well, it does if you let it. Okay. What happens, I see it happen time and time again, not just with marginal performers, but with stars. They go to Hollywood, they make a lot of money, and they get offered a lot of money, and that's what they do. Um, and, you know, I mean, you're working, you know, you work six or eight weeks on a movie and you're getting, no, those guys, not me, I mean, enormous amounts of money. And, la and you know, I mean, the, the interesting thing about the movie business is they treat you like you're four years old. You know, <laughs> the car will be there to pick you up. It's <laughs> early in the morning, please be ready. And, you know, here you, you're expected to get your ass to rehearsal on time, you know, and learn your lines. I mean, you have to be like an adult in the, in the theater business. But in the movie business, you're a baby. <laughs> and you make all this money and you do two minutes worth of work a day, you know, three minutes or something like that. Which is not to say that it's so completely easy, but it's different from this. This is a, an adult business. You're expected to be an adult. You're expected to learn your lines. You're expected to show up and do your work and so on and so forth. But as a movie business, panders to you as a six-year-old. And it's that pandering that takes the, can dull the art well, history the in you? I think the money, too. I mean, it's interesting. I, I became friendly with Rod Steiger before he died in uh, the last three or four years. I did Iceman Cometh in Chicago, and we got, Frank Rich came out to Chicago and gave us a great review in the New York Times. And I started getting letters from Rod Steiger in which he would say repeatedly, I admire your courage so much, your guts to go and do this. This is Rod Steiger, Did you one of the work? great yeah. actors. Great stage actors of all time. Of our times, yeah. but he wouldn't go back. Yeah. He, he didn't have the confidence. I, I used to say to him, Rod, what the hell, what are they gonna take away from you? Right. What can it cost you? Right. I remember when, when I became an actor and my dad said, uh, you, you have to be careful because you're going to lose. And I said, well, Dad, what am I going to lose? I got nothing anyway. You know, what are they going to do? Take that lousy $17,000 house away from me? Who gives a <laughs> shit? Let them take it. Hmm. I mean, I, you know, there was nothing to lose. And Rod had nothing to lose. And I think what happens is that in, in Hollywood, there's a tendency for people to think, if I go back there and the critics beat me up or somebody beats me up, I'll lose something. Well, there's nothing to lose. No. You can only gain. I mean, I, I've always worked in the theater ever since, you know, I always go back to Chicago. Bob and I kind of, you know, found this success together, uh, working in Chicago and then eventually coming to New York and having salesmen and now this and so forth. And Bob's done other things. I mean, Aida and so forth. <laughs> those, well, he gets those checks from Disney. There, yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, let me tell you it hasn't ruined his artistic soul yet, has it? I mean, not, but not only that, but I mean, he had to literally put that thing back on its feet. Yeah. He had to rewrite it yeah. completely. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the point is that what, yeah. what, what, what can they take from you? Yeah. You do a play like Death of a Salesman, you do translations, which was not a success. No, but right? a wonderful play, a Brian Friel play. play. Wonderful play. Yeah. What, 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 what can it cost you? What can they take away from you? I mean, compared to, you know, doing some jerk-off TV series or... Uh, you've done Salesman with Falls. You've done Long Day's Journey into Night with Falls. What are you going to do? Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf with Falls next? Are you, are you going to go <laughs> through the, the great... I'm play the Uda Hagen part. <laughs> yeah. Are you Just going through the, different. the great um, American plays? Well, we're, no, we're not actually now talking about maybe doing... Shakespeare. One of Willie the Shakes plays, yeah. Lear? Maybe. Have you ever you know, played Lear? Not only that, not only have I not played Lear, I have played uh, Shakespeare, but I haven't played Lear. But, uh, but the fact that one of my first job was playing Macbeth. Mm. I was at this Catholic boys' school, uh, 1952, 1953, and, and everybody always says, my God, you had a lot of guts, 13, 14 years old playing Macbeth. I said, not nearly as much guts as the 
young boy who played <laughs> Lady Macbeth. <laughs> <laughs> he really had guts. <laughs> um, uh, Brian Denny, it's a terrific performance as James Tyrone, a misunderstood guy, I think, to some extent, in Long Day's Journey and Tonight. I agree. Uh, at the uh, Plymouth Theater. Thanks for bringing our guest. Thank you. Talk. Appreciate it. Yeah, I haven't seen you yet in another the country, so I'm coming to see you. Bring your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Bring a peanut butter sandwich with you. There you go. First of all, I'm embarrassed to don't come to the fact that I didn't say anything about my fellow players. I'm such a schmuck. But I was so surprised. I, I thought Eddie Azard was the man. And I was completely caught off guard. And so here I am not thanking Vanessa Redgrave, who only gives the performance of a goddamn decade. So please write this down. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Friedrich Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, and public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Playbill Online is the official website of Theater Talk and the home of the Playbill Club, providing information and opportunities for theater lovers. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night.